Hey guys, welcome back to History 1301. Today's lecture is over the New Republic, right? So last week we discussed the compromises necessary during the Constitutional Convention. We talked about the Great Compromise, right? Which deals with representation in both houses of Congress, right? Both the legislature, um, House of Representatives, as well as the Senate. We also talked about the Three-Fifths Compromise, right? Which dealt over the issue of slavery, uh, the provision regarding the slave trade. Um, it also, uh, we also talked about uh, defining federalism, right? So the whole system of checks and balances and, you know, the three branches of government and what kind of powers they have, right? All written into the U.S. Constitution. Um, so, you know, these three branches, they are going to share the responsibility of government um, with their specific duties and all of that. So we, we talked about that as well as the ratification process that was necessary to get the Constitution approved, right? Because remember, we're coming out of the Articles of Confederation. They just didn't work. Um, and so they have this convention to fix the, radical, uh, the articles, uh, but that's where all of the debates started, right? And people that were opposed to uh, doing away, you know, scrapping the articles and those that wanted to, you know, fix them. And, you know, all the compromises came in after that. So, you know, um, now that the states have ratified the constitution, we, we end, you know, the Bill of Rights, right? Which were the first 10 amendments to it. Um, it is going to be the law of the land and it's going to serve as the blueprint for you know, our governing structure, right? But during the first years, uh, there's going to be a lot of disagreements about how to interpret the constitution and in what direction the country should go, okay? There's gonna be a lot of um, debate <laughs> over that, okay? So today uh, we are going to discuss how the government functioned under the new US constitution. Um, so let me see if I can start clicking through this. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna discuss how the government functioned under the new US constitution. Uh, then we'll explain the disagreements that arose over how the U.S. should be run, in what direction, as well as who those individuals were and why they felt so passionately about their position. Um, then we'll analyze the Federalist era, uh, Washington and Adams's presidency. Uh, and then uh, we'll understand the development of the two-party system and explain the election process that led to Thomas Jefferson's presidency, right? A very convoluted mess, a little quirk in the US constitution that, uh, you know, made the election of 1800 such a mess, right? But anyways, we'll get to that later. All right, so let's begin. So uh, let's talk about this new government, right? So one of the first things that we need to address is how the government is going to function um, under the new US Constitution. Okay, that's sort of like the, the main point that we have to uh, address for today's lecture. Um, several institutions are going to be established under the new government. Um, so we're gonna to start to see the development of a system of federal courts, right? Remember that under the Articles of Confederation, there wasn't any judicial branch. Um, it was basically just a legislature and each state had one vote, right? Equal, you need a unanimous approval to make any, any major changes to the articles. Um, but that's all gone. That's in the past, right? We've come up with the US Constitution. We said that we're going to come up with, um, you know, a separation of power. So you get the legislative, the executive and the judicial. And so they have to set up this national court system. Okay. Now, remember another thing as well, is that one of the caveats, right, to get the Constitution approved and ratified by the states, not all the states, right, they just needed nine, they didn't need unanimous approval, they just needed 
uh, I think it was a three fourths majority. So three out of the 13 needed to approve it and vote and say yes. So, but part of that compromise was that they needed to set up a bill of rights. They needed to create a, the pass the first 10 amendments uh, to the constitution. This was a promise. This was part of the deal uh, of the ratification process. And then we're gonna have to establish an executive department, uh, you know, with its cabinet members and their duties and, you know, reporting to the president. And so in essence here, we're actually gonna be establishing a lot of very, very important precedents with an E um, during Washington's tenure as, you know, first president of the United States under the US constitution. And then of course, one of the big issues with the Articles of Confederation was that they didn't have any federal power to raise revenue. Couldn't tax, couldn't make the state send them any money. But now under the US constitution, they can and they will and there will be some problems. Okay, so we'll talk about that. But first, let's talk about the election of George Washington, right? Um, one of the things about George Washington is that he's the only president that was elected unanimously um, by the Electoral College, right? Uh, and the interesting thing about it, the irony in all of this is that he doesn't want to do any of these things, right? But he had so much prestige and power and he could pull people together that people would go along with these issues or with these uh, you know, laws or changes if he agreed, right? So if he was on board, people were on board because of how much they respected him, how much they liked him. I mean, George Washington is the man right? And he's been the man for a while now, right? Um, he's been fighting since 1775. And, uh, you know, now it's 1790. Uh, for 15 years, he's been the man. And he's tired of all this squabbling, uh, you know, uh, at the Constitutional Convention, and all of this. I mean, like when he gets elected, you know, some people want to make him king. Uh, but, you know, he really honestly believes that there will be no kings here. Um, he believes it. And um, John Adams is going to become his vice president, uh, who will eventually, you know, replace him uh, when uh, Adams doesn't seek to be reelected eight years later. Uh, but it's just such an interesting thing um, with Washington, man. I mean, he just really kind of like sage character, really very, very, I don't know, interesting guy, very quiet, reserved. But, you know, when he spoke, people listened and they followed him um, into battle, you know, into politics, all of these things. But anyways, one of the first order of business is to establish a presidential cabinet. And these are the most important set of advisors the closest ones to the president. Um, so he's going to choose four individuals to lead these most important, you know, departments, executive cabinets uh, within the U.S. government. Um, he's going to choose them specifically because they have different points of view. OK, he's not going to choose a bunch of yes men that are just going to go along with anything that he says. You know, he does this. He picks people from different points of view. Um, because he thinks that this is in the interest of the nation. Uh, the idea here is that, yeah, they're going to come from different, you know, parts of the country, different perspectives about how the government should be run, about how, what kind of government, the power, what kind of power the government should have. And because of that, they are going to be forced to compromise in the interest of the nation. So the idea here is that they are going to put their country first rather than any kind of political differences or personal interest, okay? Uh, the idea is to get them to work together in the interest of the American people. And so he chooses uh, Thomas Jefferson from Virginia as his secretary of state. Uh, remember also that Jefferson had been away, right? He, yes, he wrote the Declaration of Independence, but he spent all that time until now um, in, in France, right? Serving as a, um, what do you call it, as a, oh my gosh, as a diplomat, right, for the United States, essentially, in France. So he's been away. He wasn't at the Constitutional Convention, but now he's back, 
and he's going, he's one of, you know, Washington's trusted guys. So he's going to serve as Secretary of State because he's got all of this, you know, previous diplomatic experience, you know, when he served uh, in, in, on behalf of the United States in France. So uh, then he's going to pick Secretary of War, Henry Knox, uh, who's from Mass Massachusetts. Um, then you got Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton from New York. Um, again, very different than Jefferson. Uh, Attorney General Edmund Randolph, who's from Virginia. Um, and then you have the Postmaster General, um, but the, you know, which is a position within the executive cabinet, but the other four, the first four that I just mentioned are the most important ones, right? Not that the Postmaster General isn't, it's a position within the executive branch, but these are the ones that are gonna become uh, the most problematic. Uh, and, you know, as we move forward, when these issues come up, Washington is turning to them for advice and input. So now that you know who these guys are, and now that you know why Washington picked them, um, one of the things that you have to understand here is why is this important, right? Why does Washington pick a bunch of guys that don't like each other, have very little in common with each other in, in terms of like politics and their views on government? Um, so why does he do this? Is he setting himself up for failure? Well, no, not necessarily, <laughs> but he does this again to reiterate this point. He does this because he believes it's in the interest of the nation, right? They're going to be forced to work together. They're going to be forced to compromise. Therefore, uh, you know, serving the actual purpose of this democratic process that is the US Constitution, okay? Shared system of checks and balances and all of that. I mean, it's a thing of beauty, uh, but it's gonna come with its set of headaches for sure, okay? Um, let's talk about the court system, all right? So we, we did talk about how, you know, one of the, one of the main uh, parts, components, of the US Constitution is in setting up a judiciary branch. So 1789, the Judiciary Act of 1789 is gonna be passed by Congress to organize uh, the judicial branch. So at the very top, you have here uh, the Supreme Court, right? With six members. Now there isn't anything on there that says that it has to be six or it has to be nine or it has to be 13, it doesn't say. Uh, so originally, it, they, they're going to have six members on the Supreme Court. John Jay is going to serve as the first Chief Justice, um, you know, the head of the Supreme Court. Um, and then underneath the Supreme Court, you have 13 district courts or 13 states, right? Uh, because, of course, the Supreme Court is the highest court of the land. And then you have your state courts, right? And then your municipals and all of that, all of your locals. So uh, in this case, um, the Supreme Court, right? Thanks to the Judiciary Act of 1789, the Supreme Court, and I cannot stress this enough, the Supreme Court is the only one that is authorized to review state decisions. All right. Um, and so this law, this Judiciary Act of 1789 is important because it reinforces the United States Supreme Court as the highest court in the land. OK, so what does that mean? Well, it means that in short, um, basically that the Supreme Court has superiority, uh, supremacy, um, over all of the other courts, okay? Especially when it comes to constitutional issues. So, but again, we'll get to that in a minute because that's gonna be a problem down the road. Um, let's talk about the Bill of Rights. We talked about them last week. Let's just sort of reiterate uh, what was happening here. Um, the Bill of Rights are a promise, right? As a part of a negotiation to ratify the US Constitution. Remember, they spent all that time at the Constitutional Convention, lots of debates, lots of talk, lots of squabbling, lots of, you know, threatening to walk out. Because again, you're looking at people from opposing, you know, viewpoints, those that are extremely suspicious of uh, central governments that have a tremendous amount of power, in part because of their experience in dealing with the British, right? But 
you also have the side that looked at the Articles of Confederation and realized, you know what, that kind of government where you have a weak central government is just really not helpful. We can't do anything. And so there's all these clashes and, you know, lots of compromises, lots of debate. Um, but ultimately, out of the 17 proposed amendments to the U.S. Constitution, 12 were approved by Congress and 10 were eventually ratified. Those first 10 amendments are what we know as the Bill of Rights, okay? They are not a separate document. They are literally like the next page <laughs> after Article 4 in the U.S. Constitution, okay? Um, like I said, very, very important to the ratification process. Um, and, you know, you read them, you've done the signature assignment on that. And if you haven't, you will. Uh, but again, you know, they were necessary to get the Constitution approved by the states in order for it to go into effect as the law of the land. And uh, another thing that I wanted to mention about that is that it was for those folks that uh, were arguing that there's the powers of the government were too strong and they wanted it specifically in writing that there were certain freedoms that they wanted explicitly protected in this document that is the U.S. Constitution, right? It becomes the law of the land. It becomes like a, 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 a religious document uh, for us Americans, right? That one that we continuously fall back on um, when we perceive any kind of infringements on those rights uh, that should be protected. So anyways, if you look at those, you know, you read them, you know, they're there for a reason, right? Inalienable constitutional rights. So Anyways, why is this all important? Well, because there's going to be all of these political divisions that are going to start to pop up because of how they feel uh, over how the government should be run, um, how much power it should have. Uh, and remember, this is like something that they're doing for the first time. You know, yes, they went through all of the debates of, you know, drawing up the Constitution and, and divisions, you know, between the different branches and have all of that stuff. But there is a slight challenging problem with the Constitution is that it's not always clear on how things should be run. Um, remember, it has a certain flexibility. <laughs> you know, that it's like, well, you know, it can be interpreted in certain ways, depending on who you are. And this is where a lot of the political divisions are going to come from, right? All of these different visions for the United States moving into the future is going to create factionalism, right? So where you have like different, uh, almost like teams, okay? Um, factions. Now, Washington didn't like this and he tried to, you know, warn us and we'll get to that in a little bit, but these factions are going to develop out of the different uh, visions that people have for the United States out of the different um, mentality uh, and expectations that they have in terms of how the government should be run and, you know, how powerful it should be, how uh, what kind of an impact it should have on the American people. So, uh, and so we're going to start to see these factions come out and become even more emphasized as the nation deals with these sets of problems. The problem of finance, the problem of government power, and foreign policy. Okay, so we're going to talk about the national debt. We're going to talk about the Whiskey Rebellion, and we're going to talk about the French Revolution. Now, has the United States dealt with issues of problem with finance and problem of power and problem of foreign policy? Yes, we saw this during the Articles of Confederation. And remember, could the Articles of Confederation deal with these problems with the pirates, with the debt, right? Shays Rebellion, uh, no, <laughs> they couldn't, right? That was part of the reason why they had to get rid of it was because it didn't have the, the authority, the power to deal with these problems. But now that they do, we're going to go back to these problems of finance, of government power, of foreign policy. And because there are these political divisions, because there are these factions that are developing, 
the divisions are going to become uh, clearer, much more pronounced, and very problematic for this new nation. Okay, so let's talk about who makes up these political factions. Um, you know, it's almost like I said, uh, <laughs> it's almost unimaginable the amount of prestige that Washington has. But as good as he is, he's going to have problems with these factions, okay? He warns his, you know, uh, contemporaries, but he tries to warn everybody, us too, about the dangers of political parties and in general, political factions, right? But do we listen? No, we didn't. And here we are, <laughs> more divided than ever. Um, so let's talk about who are these um, two political factions. Um, you know, he's anticipating these problems. He tries to warn uh, people that, you know, uh, not to get too caught up in these debates rather than helping the progress along. But anyways, the difference between these ideologies was clear during the Constitutional Convention. And like I said, unfortunately, he was right. So our first uh, like two-party system here is going to be the Federalist, right? Um, who are not to be confused with, you know, the Federalist, Anti-Federalist. That was a constitutional debate issue okay um not all federalists that were for the constitution become federalists in the federalist party okay case in point like james madison all right james madison remember the father of the u.s constitution um with the main architect uh not a federalist okay and we'll talk about the reasons why so not the same thing all right so federalists federalists like washington hamilton John Adams, right? They are going to be like the main uh, leaders of this political faction or political party. Uh, on the other side, you have the Democratic Republicans, okay? And you're like, what? Democratic and Republicans? Yes. <laughs> okay. So not like the Democrats today, not like the Republicans today, Democratic and Republican, okay? Which is like totally different than what we understand those words to mean today. So this is uh, our second political party. Who are the leaders? Jefferson, right? Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, right? Both Virginians, both highly suspicious of, uh, you know, the kind of power and influence that the government should have on the lives of average Americans. And uh, the reasons for that are explain right here for you okay so what is it that federalists believe <coughs> excuse me what is it that federalists believe well when you look at um the uh what do you call it and who the leadership is right here you have alexander hamilton john adams uh this party right the federalist party is going to appeal to manufacturers, wealthy merchants, uh, the wealthy class in general, um, the educated. Uh, it's going to also favor, you know, the bigger cities, those along the coast. Um, when it comes to its views on government, they believe in a strong central government, you know, that it should be more powerful than the state's government, okay? When it comes to the interpretation of the Constitution, and interpretation, I mean, like, you know, you read the Constitution, ooh, this is what it means. <laughs> they are going to apply what is known as a loose construction of the Constitution. Um, what it means is that, you know, they're willing to bend it a little bit, right, where uh, it, it's, it's um, flexible. And again, you know, we'll talk about that right now. So what they're saying here basically is that they are all for implied powers. What is an implied thing? What does that mean? Well, it means that it's not necessarily written word for word, but it's implied, right? It's like, that's what they're trying to say. And so you have to kind of argue that. That's what loose construction of the constitution means is that uh, it's flexible, it can be implied, but it doesn't say it word for word explicitly in the constitution. And again, like I said, when you look at the Democratic Republicans, this is one of the major problems that they have. 
with guys like Alexander Hamilton, okay? Because they're like, well, it doesn't say in the Constitution you can do this, so you can't do this. And, well, you know, we'll see in a minute what happens. Uh, okay, um, what else, what else? Uh, so wealthy and educated are involved. It limits, uh, you know, freedom of speech and the press. We'll talk about the reasons why. Um, and it preferred to a style of government similar to that of a king, right, with a strong executive. And you can see why, you know, the Democratic Republicans would have a problem with that. Um, when it comes to domestic policy, um, so things dealing with, you know, issues at home, they are going to be on the side of a national bank. They support that idea because this is good for businesses, right? Um, they support an excise tax. Uh, they support a national debt because they think that is good for the country. Um, and we'll explain the reasons why in a little bit. Um, and then you got the national government assuming states debt. Um, again, that was part of the compromises as well. Um, and then that tariffs, right? Taxes should be high. All right. When it comes to foreign policy, they are totally opposed to the French Revolution or our involvement with the French. Um, <clears throat> and Federalists on, in general are going to be on the side of the British, right? We want to be like the British. We want to emulate the British Empire. We want to be just like them. We don't want to be their enemies, okay? So when it comes to foreign policy issues, if we have to choose the French and the British, Federalists are going to go along with the British side, okay, which is why we're going to get into problems later on. But nevertheless, let's talk about who the Democratic Republicans are. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, of course, right, which is why they're also called the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans, but never you mind about that. Uh, so you got Thomas Jefferson, James Madison's are as the head of this political faction. Uh, who does it benefit? Who does it attract? Who likes the Democratic Republican Party and their ideals? You got farmers, planters, common people, regular folk. Uh, it, it's policies and its view uh, is seen as largely favoring the Southern states and Western states as well. We so, saw, you know, continued westward expansion, uh, not like, uh, unlike the, um, Federalists, right, which favor, you know, the, the northern states, the bigger cities, and the ones along the coast, right? Very different policies. Um, when it comes to these ideas of government, the Democratic Republicans, they believe that the state should be, you know, more powerful, that they should have more rights over the national government. And so when it comes to issues of interpretation of the U.S. Constitution, they believe in a strict interpretation. What did, I, what did I say that means? It means that it has to be literally, like literally, literally written into the constitution that says you can do this. Otherwise you cannot, right? And as the 10th amendment of the constitution says, any power or right not explicitly denied to the states and now granted to the federal government is reserved for the states, right? And so, <laughs> oh, this is where it comes in, right? The, the divisions between Federalists and Democratic Republicans. If it's not written in there, say the Democrats, you cannot do it. It belongs to the states. It's a state's rights because Democratic Republicans are for states' rights. On the other hand, Federalists are going to argue, oh, ho, ho, hold on, because the elastic clause says that anything that is necessary and proper, Congress should deal with it, right? And so this is where the Constitution gets vague. This is where the Constitution is not very specific. And this is part of the reason why you're going to have these two political factions, right? Because for the Federalist, they believe that anything that is necessary and proper, then they can go ahead and deal with it. Whereas those that would rather have the states have that power, reserve that power, are going to argue that the US Constitution should be interpreted in a strict construction, right? It has to be expressed, enumerated, implicit, <laughs> right? It has to literally be written in there, otherwise it belongs to the state. So yeah, huge, huge problem here. Um, now again, they didn't do this on purpose, right? They did this 
to make it flexible enough so that if these problems come up, they can deal with them. But this is why you get these political factions later on, okay? Um, all right, so who does the uh, Democratic Party favor? Uh, you know, common man, but educated as well. Uh, to them, the Bill of Rights is sacred and you cannot turn your back on them. You cannot, you know, step on them. Um, and, you know, when you look at the Democratic uh, Republican Party, they believe that smaller government is better, okay? So again, when it comes to issues of domestic policy, they are strongly against the national bank uh, because that favors the businesses, right? And not the regular people, not the farmers and planters. They are against an excise tax. They are against the national debt. Uh, they believe that the states, you know, uh, who pay their own debt uh, are going to be freer in the end. Um, and that tariffs should be low, okay? Um, when it comes to foreign policy issues, especially with dealing with the French and the British, um, they oppose going to war with the French. They are actually supporters of the French Revolution, um, and they're going to favor the French all the way. All right. All right. Let's talk about some of these uh, major players. Uh, all right, so you got Alexander Hamilton. Oh my gosh. So Alexander Hamilton is this just a whiz kid. Okay, just incredibly smart. Um, he's a genius. Uh, he's eloquent, elegant, uh, progressive factionalist. Uh, you know, they revolve around him. Um, you know, he served as Washington's aide de camp during the uh, Revolutionary War. So he knows him. He's almost like a, like a, you know, like a son to Washington, right? Like a son he never had. They have a very close bond, uh, very personal. Um, he also, uh, you know, envisions the United States as this economic powerhouse, wants the United States to emulate the British, right? That's the vision that he has for, for the United States. He's a visionary on that front, okay? Um, the problem with that is that that doesn't exist. <laughs> that United States that he envisions, that future does not exist, all right. He is talking about having like a system of like banks and big cities and infrastructure, you know, again, just like the British, just like London. Uh, he wants the direction to the, the direction of the, the nation to go that way. But he's going to have, you know, a hell of a fight here um, because that just doesn't exist. Uh, and again, remember, we just got out of the war with Britain. So people are looking at his plan for the United States and going like, wait a minute, like, you're just a closet monarchist. You just really love the British. Like, what's going on here? So, uh, but people like-minded love him. Uh, like I said, Washington looks, you know, looks to him for advice. Uh, and when I say eloquent, I really mean it. Like, he writes and writes and writes. I mean, he is passionate uh, about, you know, putting things in writing and, you know, Washington uses him uh, for his skills during the war. And then of course, you know, he has his secretary of the treasury. So uh, again, um, hugely influential when it comes to the, to the direction that the United States is going to go in. Uh, very, very important uh, as an advisor to Washington. Um, but, and part of his plan, his economic, you know, tax plan is to have, you know, uh, these investors uh, kind of like, you know, the big corporations, the wealthy should be tied in to the success of the nation. If you can bring them in, then our country is going to be okay. And that's what he's hoping to achieve here. Okay. So he is influenced by the British. He is a total visionary, uh, but the country is a mess. <laughs> it's a wreck. And they have to work towards achieving this vision. And that's the problem. All right. So uh, let's talk about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, also a genius, right? I mean, on, a genius on so many different levels. Like this guy is a prominent member of, you know, Virginian society. He is a, an agrarian aristocrat. What does that mean? That means that he made a lot of money, uh, you know, plantations and stuff like that. 
Uh, but this guy, like I said, he is a genius, right? He knows Washington personally too. Um, <laughs> uh, he is, uh, you know, he, he's into philosophy. He's into like agricultural uh, architecture. Uh, you know, he designed Monticello. Like, I mean, this guy's like all over the place. He's a genius on on like different levels than um, Alexander Hamilton, like, you know, different levels. Uh, remember, he is the author, primary author of the Declaration of Independence. Remember, he wrote that like in a day. OK, so is this guy talented? Absolutely. But he's nothing like Alexander Hamilton personally. Alexander Hamilton is bold and outspoken and loves getting into these like debates. Uh, public debates with people and <laughs> loves to win. Jefferson's not like that. Uh, Jefferson is shy. He's quiet. He's reserved, um, but also incredibly uh, smart and talented. Uh, actually doesn't like getting into these public debates. Cannot stand Alexander Hamilton. Um, he's a great book collector. Um, in fact, his personal library becomes the foundation for the Library of Congress. And if you ever have a chance to go uh, out to Washington, D.C. and see it, uh, visit the Library of Congress. I mean, you can't even go in it, right? But there's like this like viewing room where you're just like looking. It's amazing. It's huge. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Um, but, you know, it's, there's other issues also with uh, Thomas Jefferson, right? I mean, he's a slave owner. He does you know, think that slavery is a bad deal for the country, but he doesn't set his own slaves free, um, in part because, you know, he was into so much debt, not like with Washington, right? When Washington dies, he's, he frees his slaves. Jefferson doesn't, um, but he still thinks it's a bad deal for the nation. Um, like I said, he's soft-spoken, uh, not a people person. <laughs> um, he, uh, is completely different from Alexander Hamilton. He doesn't like to get into these personal confrontations. He just has a different type of personality altogether. They, the two of them do not get along. And think about this, right? They are two of Washington's advisors. And they are literally like in the room with him when dealing with these problems, dealing with these political issues and domestic issues. And they're going at it, you know, <laughs> like trying to buy for like Washington's support. Um when it comes to Jefferson's idea of, you know, freedom um, for individuals, it is best protected by a nation of small farmers willing to stand up for their rights, right? So what he wants to do, his vision for the United States is a nation of, you know, small independent farmers. Um, it has absolutely no resemblance to Hamilton's vision, right? But in 1790, this is literally what the country looks like. <laughs> like it is a nation of independent farmers, right? Hamilton's vision is for the future. Uh, and uh, you know, again, this is gonna become a problem down the road, okay? All right, so let's talk about the problem of finance, right? So this is Alexander Hamilton's uh, financial plan. Remember, the national debt was at a crushing $54 million. This was the, you know, Revolutionary War debt, right? Remember, wars cost money, and uh, they are finding that out. So what are they going to do about it? How are they going to raise revenue? Well, Hamilton hoped to pay off, you know, all of the foreign um, debt and to be able to have a national government assume the state's debt, okay? Now, there are four key components to his financial plan. The first of this is consolidating loans. Okay, now by doing so, you're essentially going to commit the wealthy, uh, the wealthy businesses, the wealthy uh, Americans to the success of the nation. Okay, this is key to his financial plan. Then uh, the second part of this is consolidating the state's debt into the national debt. So, you know, it, the reason for this is to make the states beholden to the federal government. The third component of Hamilton's financial plan is to raise revenue. So how are they going to do this? Um, they're going to do this by uh, putting in taxes, um, sale of public land, 
uh, selling of bonds, that sort of thing, okay? And then lastly, and, and one of the most important elements of his financial plan is to have a first national bank, okay? Now, there's gonna be some debate over this, right? Because for him, it makes perfect sense. You would have a place where you would hold the government's money, uh, a way to issue you know, paper money uh, and legal tender, but there's gonna be tremendous opposition over this because uh, while some states are gonna support his proposal, others like Virginia had already paid off all their debt and they're not really willing to compromise on this issue. So, what are the opposition uh, going to say? Well, they're saying that only speculators are going to benefit. Speculators are, of course, like investors, right? The wealthy. Uh, that only speculators benefit from Hamilton's financial plan. And like I said, that some states had already paid off their debt. So they don't see really the point in, you know, giving over any power to the federal government. Um, there's also a tremendous fear that these financiers, these banks are gonna be given preferential treatment by the federal government. And so, you know, they have to reach some kind of compromise. So the way that it works is Hamilton has to, you know, he's gonna propose, this is my financial plan for the future of the United States, but Congress still has to approve it and he just doesn't have the vote. So. He needs to find a way to compromise with the Democratic Republicans. You know, they don't like him. They don't like his plan. Uh, and so <laughs> there is going to be a meeting um, with Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. So Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton are going to have a dinner uh, where they're basically having a meeting here. Um, they are eventually going to reach a compromise. Uh, you know, they're, you could say they have kind of like a meeting of the mind, so to speak, right? And um, in essence, what comes out of this meeting, right, out of this dinner, uh, is that the South is going to agree to Hamilton's financial plan. Uh, they are going to, you know, assume... <laughs> Uh, that the national government assumes the state's debt, that's one thing, but they also want the U.S. capital to become, I'm sorry, yeah, they, they also want Washington, D.C. to become the capital of the United States, and so this is kind of like, you know, we'll give you the votes, we'll help you pass your uh, financial plan, but we want Washington, D.C. to become the capital of the United States. The plan being that, you know, the South is gonna benefit from this the most. But in the end, you know, while it might look like Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans got what they wanted, in the end, who really won? Like whose vision became true? Um, it was Hamilton, right? I mean, even though they moved the capital from the North to Washington, D.C., so what? So what, they already had all the banks, they had all the infrastructure in place. Uh, the banks weren't gonna go anywhere, right? They stayed in New York City. And so in the end, it's uh, Washington, I'm sorry, it's Hamilton's financial plan. It's his vision for America, the one that came true, not Jefferson's, okay? So, <laughs> spoiler alert. <laughs> All right, so what compromise did Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson reach over the bank? Let's see, the capital city would move to Virginia, uh, the capital city would stay in New York, that Hamilton would stop pushing Congress to create a first national bank, or is it none of these? Well, the correct answer is A, right? That the capital city would move to the south, to the Virginia border, right, on the Potomac. Good, now let's move on to the Bank of the United States. Uh, now, again, Hamilton supports the creation of a national bank in part because this is going to benefit the business classes, the rich, the wealthy. It allows the government to organize its loans, its money, its debt. Um, but there's a problem here, okay? Because there is nothing in the constitution about the creation of a national bank, okay? so. Nothing specifically, right? But according to Hamilton, yes, there is, right? We got all these benefits, 
right? It's going to provide a safe place to deposit the government's money. It's going to help regulate all these other banks. But is it constitutional? Democratic Republicans, right? Those that believe in the strict interpretation of the Constitution argue that it is not constitutional because it is not explicitly written in there. But Hamilton's view, right, and that of the Federalists, which believe in a loose interpretation of the Constitution, say, yes, it is. It is in there. Under the Elastic Clause, right, in Article 1, where it says Congress has the power to make all laws that are necessary and proper, is what gives the federal government the authority to create a national bank, right? Is it necessary and proper? Yeah, in Hamilton's view, it is, okay? So, like I said, uh, Democratic Republicans, they don't like this, right? Because it doesn't explicitly say that Congress has a right to do this. It is not written in the Constitution that the Constitution doesn't give Congress that power. It gives it to the states, right? According to the 10th Amendment of the Constitution. Um, any power that is not specifically denied to the states and also not given to the federal government shall remain with the state. And so Hamilton can argue all day long that it's, you know, uh, implied powers, that it's necessary and proper. Um, and the problem here, you guys, is that Washington agrees with him. And to Jefferson's, you know, horror, uh, to his um, disapproval, to his um, disappointment, uh, Washington agrees with Hamilton and signs the bill into law, therefore creating the Bank of the United States. Okay, so it's going to stay um, around for the next 20 years. And again, we talked about the reasons why Democratic Republicans don't like this. Okay, and, and again, it's just going to make more divisions between Federalists and Democratic Republicans, right? And in this case, who won? Hamilton or Jefferson? Hamilton, right? So it's like two wins for Hamilton. Uh, why did the Democratic Republicans oppose Hamilton's plan for the bank? So again, why are Jefferson and Madison and all of these uh, Democratic Republicans against it? Well, let's see, let's look at the choices. Uh, they believed in a loose construction of the Constitution, which gave Congress Im implied powers. Um, is that the Democratic Republicans? Hmm. They felt it did not give enough power to the federal government. Hmm. Is that what Democratic Republicans want? No, it's not. Uh, they believed it would favor bankers and merchants over farmers and plantation owners. That's the answer. That's who they are. That's who they're fighting for. And that's what they believe. Okay, so that's why they don't like his plan. So that's the answer. Okay, so let's talk about the issue of government power as illustrated by the Whiskey Rebellion, okay? So in Pennsylvania, Hamilton's decision to tax whiskey was very divisive. And part of the reason for that is because Pennsylvania is an overwhelmingly agricultural state. Uh, they grow a lot of grain, which they use to make, you know, animal feed and flour for bread, but they also use it to make whiskey. <laughs> whiskey is a highly tradable commodity, right? Everybody wants it. Everybody's willing to trade and barter for it. Um, and part of the reason for that is because it was easier to make, you know, distill uh, the whiskey than it is to transport the grain. Um, also, you know, a lot of people use whiskey um, in the country uh, as a method of payment, right? They don't really have a lot of use for paper money uh, because everything that they need is there. You know, they got the goats running around, they got the cows, they, you know, everything is there. This really upset them because to them, you know, whiskey is not a business, it's a hobby. And for Hamilton's argument, you know, he basically tells them like, if you're making it, if you're trading, then you're selling it. <laughs> and, you know, farmers know because of what they've learned because of the American Revolution, that if they riot, you know, they can basically pressure the government to take that tax away. And so they go ahead and they riot. Okay, let me go ahead and show you a couple of things over here. I forgot to place uh, 
the cursor. But basically, you know, they place a tax on whiskey. And, you know, for George Washington, you know, it's kind of a difficult thing because, you know, he has to uh, let these guys know, like, hey, this whole, like, no taxation without representation, like, we're not playing that game anymore. You can claim no taxation without representation because because these guys, they were elected by you, so they represent you. And, you know, it's really kind of a tricky situation. But he's going to issue out a proclamation declaring that the farmers are in rebellion. And when he does this, you know, it really upsets them. Um, but the message here is twofold. Number one is this. Revolutionary times are over, right? We're not playing that game anymore. The representatives in Congress passed a law and they speak for the will of the people. Right now, you may not like the taxes that they're passing right now, but you still have to obey them. Right. I mean, what can you do about it? Well, you know, pass another tax and get rid of the one that you don't like. But you have to do it through the democratic process because you cannot claim no taxation without representation anymore. I mean, he's threatening to use military force here. He's, you know, he's leading them himself. And one of the results here is, well, he's going to put down the whiskey rebellion but this is going to create an environment where there's two very different views of the government right government power specifically so it's going to create an environment where there is these two different views of government power right there's an element that want to challenge whether the federal government has the authority to do this this area will become largely anti-federalist and are going to favor the Democratic Republican Party from now on, okay? All right, so let's talk about uh, the Whiskey Rebellion. I have a little quiz for you. Uh, what was the cause of the 1794 Whiskey Rebellion? Was it A, because President Washington outlawed whiskey? I mean, I'd be mad too, but that's not why. Uh, was it B, Western farmers objected to the tax on whiskey? Maybe. Uh, was it because President Washington executed hundreds of whiskey smugglers? That's not what happened. Or was it D, Eastern bankers objected to the tax on whiskey? No, wasn't it, right? It was letter B. Farmers are pissed over the tax on whiskey, right? Uh, I mean, who wouldn't be? But they're not just upset over the tax on whiskey. They're upset because to them, this distilling the whiskey is a hobby. They use it, uh, you know, to barter, to trade. Um, and they also question whether the federal government actually has the authority to tax the whiskey, period, right? But Washington answered that question. And so in many ways, when you look at the whiskey rebellion and the way that Washington responds to it, um, it essentially, this is like the revolutionary process coming to a stop, right? Because remember, they're breaking away from England and then it swings back in the opposite direction. They create this like uh, democratic republic. But the process stops right there, right? The U.S. Constitution essentially subverts the ideals of the revolution um, for stability, for law and order, and that's exactly what's going to happen during this very important phase of the early years of the United States under the U.S. Constitution, okay? Okay, so let's talk about foreign policy. Remember, this was an issue during the Articles of Confederation, but now under the U.S. Constitution, how is the new government going to deal with these problems? The first thing we're going to talk about is the problem with France, okay? Now, the French Revolution starts in 1789, and it really starts to heat up around the 90s. Okay, one of the most influential events in modern history has, you know, ramifications leading up until, even till today. But, you know, when it comes to the American Revolution, remember, they wanted to create a stable government, right, through democracy and give the will to the American people. But it also balanced government authority, right, through its systems of checks and balances. Remember, I just mentioned it essentially stops the revolutionary process, right? but it doesn't happen under the French Revolution, right? In the French Revolution, remember, they take power away from the monarchy, right? Uh, they cut off his head and Marie Antoinette's, um, and then it swings like a massive pendulum, right? Where uh, it goes from the monarchy, right? Authoritarian uh, government, 
to the revolution, they remove the monarchy and on all of the institutions that are essentially tied to it. And then, uh, you know, Napoleon, well, actually, then you have like the terror. <laughs> And then, you know, Napoleon takes it over and then, you know, it swings in the opposite direction back to like this um, authoritarian, right? Where he wants to become like the emperor and stuff like that, take over Europe. But anyways, um, like I said, it, it just gets crazy during these, uh, these years. Uh, you know, they basically make religion illegal. They exile or they kill the priest. It's all kinds of crazy going on. I mean, it's called the terror for a reason, right? Robespierre and it's insane, right? So how is the U.S. going to react to what's happening in France? Well, that depends on whether you're a federalist or a democratic Republican, right? People are divided over the events taking place in France, especially they're alarmed when the revolutionaries kill Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, okay? Um, <laughs> Republican, uh, you know, Democratic Republicans sympathize with, you know, the revolution, the French Revolution and the people that are fighting for it, you know, because it's the same Democratic and uh, ideals, liberty, fraternity that, you know, the American Revolutionary was about. But um, wow. remember that there's these two factions within the U.S. government that are dividing, you know, the opinion um, and it's you know dividing uh, Washington's cabinet too. So let's talk about the Citizen Genet affair, okay? Now, this guy is an ambassador that arrives in the United States from France, right? He is a revolutionary from the French Republic. Now he arrives in the United States because he wants the support of the Americans, right? Now, the reception was mixed, right? Some remember the French contribution to the American Revolution. And I mean, you should remember this too, right? Because I told you, without the French assistance, there's really no way that the Americans would have been able to uh, fight as long as they did uh, and ultimately win, right? We were just outman, outclassed, you know, <laughs> outnumbered, uh, <laughs> just everything, right? We didn't even have a Navy, period. So some are absolutely going to remember the French contribution to the American Revolution, while others are going to point out that our alliance was with the actual French king, you know, the guy whose head was in a basket, right? <laughs> Not with this new republic. So there was no reason for, you know, pledging allegiance to them or helping them. I mean, it just didn't make any sense, right? That At least that's what the Federalists are going to argue. Now, ultimately, what's going to happen here? Well, Washington is going to have to make a decision. Are we going to side with the French, right, and help them out uh, during their, you know, revolution? Uh, or do we stay out of it? And Washington is going to choose the side of the Federalist. He's going to side with Hamilton uh, and those that are essentially, you know, like pleading uh, not to get involved because the nation is too young, because we're not prepared, because, you know, we're still trying to figure things out on our own. But also, if we get involved with the French, we're going to piss off our British friends. And so we don't want to do that. Now, by issuing neutrality, Washington is essentially going to say, we're not getting involved. We're staying out of this. France figures it out on their own. Um, and this is two weeks after Genet arrived in the United States. So, you know, uh, there's all kinds of um, problems here with this as well, because Washington knows, he basically tells them, hey, look, you know, we're not going to get involved. We're going to be neutral. You need to go back to France and you need to stop trying to pressure us into, you know, a, a war or into a conflict that we're, we don't want to be involved in. And um, you know, this is important uh, because it's going to highlight, once again, the political divisions between the parties, between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Again, Washington is going to look towards Hamilton for advice, and it's going to follow Hamilton's advice. And I guess seeing the writing on the wall here, Jefferson realizes that, you know, I, I know Washington and I consider him my friend. 
But every time there's a problem, every time there's an issue, he ignores me. And, you know, he's going by what Hamilton is saying. And so this is going to push uh, Jefferson to resign. He resigns in July 1793. And um, it's just, you know, more uh, proof of the growing divisions in American politics. Um, but uh, later on, you know, he's, he's going to run for president. So, yeah, that's coming. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about more foreign policy problems. Uh, this time though, we're gonna talk about what's happening with Britain, right? Remember, Britain was still a problem under the Articles of Confederation. We won the revolution, so they should have left, right? We won, yeah. Um, well, they're not, <laughs> okay? Because remember, they we had no army, we had no way of kicking the British out of you know the Western, um, states the territories where they were still their presence was still there um so they're still in the northwest territories uh they're actively trading with the native americans and the americans don't like this because you know it's creating more problems you know with the native americans again this is something that we're going to see further down the road with the war of 1812 and then also there's an issue of british impressment of American sailors, right? So impressment is literally like when they board these American ships and they take, uh, and by they, I mean the British are taking American sailors and forcing them, kidnapping them to serve in the Royal Navy, right? So this is what impressment is. And it's a huge problem. The British are taking American ships and its cargo, um, so yeah, it's been a constant problem uh, between the United States and Britain. And remember, under the Articles of Confederation, we had no way of stopping them, right? It's basically like the British were thumbing their nose at us and saying like, yeah, okay, so you and what army is going to stop me? <laughs> so uh, as an effort to deal with this diplomatically, um, the United States is going to send John Jay to Britain to deal a treaty, negotiate a treaty with the British. Now, Jay's Treaty, as it comes to be known uh, in 1795, is going to do a couple of things, right? First thing, the British agree to evacuate the military posts in the West, right? So good, check, right? We got that without something that they have been reluctant uh, to do, right, since the American Revolution. But now they're agreeing to do it. Um, the British also agree under Jay's Treaty uh, to pay damages for any lost cargo and ships and things like that, that they might have, the Americans might have lost um, because of the British impressment. Um, but then here's where it gets a little bit interesting because under Jay's treaty, the U.S. is going to agree to lift duties on British imports for the next 10 years. And so what that means is that the British are, are going to be able to import things to the United States or export, right? Um, and they're not going to pay any taxes. So uh, this is a problem, right? This is a problem because, well, what about American manufacturers? What about, you know, producers of these goods? They're going to be competing with these foreign goods and they're not even paying taxes. So that's not favorable to the Americans. The other problem with Jay's Treaty is that the British do not make any promises to stop impressing American sailors. And again, this is a huge problem because, because they don't concede to stopping it, they're gonna continue doing it. And it's gonna be one of the reasons why we go to war with the British again in 1812, okay? So on the whole, if we look at Jay's Treaty, right? Um, even though it's unpopular, right? I mean, Obviously, right? They, we get some things, but we don't get everything. Um, it, have, it favors the British. It really does. And I'll show you a comparison to Pinckney's treaty in a second. But Jay's treaty, even though unpopular and, and, and not really favorable for the Americans, it is important because it avoids war with the British for now, <laughs> for now, right? We'll get to that in a couple of years. So this is in 1795 and uh, 17 years, we're gonna be at war with the British again, okay? So 
let's review. Uh, what was the result of Jay's treaty? What do we get? What happened? Um, was it A, a Democratic Republicans praised the Federalists for their wise diplomacy? No, because remember, Democratic Republicans are all about the French, right? And they think, here's more proof that the Federalists love the British, right? Because look, they, they, they're not going to pay any taxes for 10 years and they did nothing about impressment. And so that is not the correct answer. Uh, letter B, Great Britain agreed to evacuate its forts along the Western border. So did that happen under the Jay's Treaty of 1795? Maybe, I remember something like that. Uh, was it C, Great Britain agreed to stop kidnapping or impressing American sailors? Did they do that? No, in fact, that's one of the reasons why we're gonna go to war uh, in 1812. So the correct answer here is letter B. We did accomplish that, but my answer right here. Uh, we did accomplish that, right? Thank God, because we had no other way of doing it. But now with the U.S. Constitution and Jay's Treaty, they're going to vacate those uh, those forts. So win, but not an entire win, right? Because there's still some concessions here, like the duties and uh, not promising to stop any impressment, which make this treaty not 100% favorable to the United States. But it's important because it's going to stop the war for now. War with Britain. All right, so let's talk about another area of concern when it comes to foreign policy. This is dealing with the Spanish. Now, was all of this, um, this disputed territory, was this a problem under the Articles of Confederation? Absolutely. But remember, we had no Navy. We had no way uh, to force the Spanish into doing anything. So this continued to be a problem. Enter Pinckney, okay? <laughs> now, Pinckney is going to negotiate a treaty between the United States and Spain uh, that is going to settle these issues once and for all. Let's see what the United States wants. Uh, first of all, the United States wants access to the port of New Orleans. New Orleans is here. Uh, look, all, all, everything that is in yellow is Spanish territory, okay? So this is not a part of the United States. But the United States wants access to it. It's a very important uh, port. We want to trade and all of that. But in addition to that, there's also boundary disputes between the United States and the Spanish, right? In, in terms of, you know, Spanish Florida and Georgia, all of this area here. Um, and so how do they solve these problems? These have been going on for a while. Um, and so Pinckney's Treaty, in 1796, only a year after Jay's treaty, is gonna do a couple of things, right? First of all, it's gonna open up the Mississippi River for American farmers. And this is great, okay? Um, for American shipping and everything, right? Because remember, this is a time when people still use rivers and stuff like that for transportation. And uh, the Mississippi, right, is going to connect everybody that's over here that's already using like the Ohio River Valley, for example. Uh, and we're going to get to use the Mississippi, even though it's in Spanish territory. So the other thing that it does is it's going to allow Americans to warehouse or deposit goods in New Orleans, right? So we wanted this, we're getting it, okay? Thanks to Pinckney's Treaty. Um, what else does Pinckney's Treaty does? Uh, do. Uh, <laughs> it's going to set up the U.S. boundary with Spain. Uh, in terms of Florida, right? So no more border dispute. It's going to settle exactly where Florida ends and where it begins. And um, and again, see, look at this treaty, right? Look at what we wanted. Look at what we got. Which treaty is better for the United States? Pinckney's treaty, right? Obviously, we got everything we wanted. So let's review what we just went over. Pinckney Treaty with Spain guaranteed Americans the right to use which port city? Was it Montreal? Was it New Orleans? Was it New York or Charleston? New Orleans, right? Remember New Orleans is controlled by the Spanish. It connects, uh, it's, you know, the mouth of the Mississippi River. All good things happens from here on in. All right, so uh, for the next uh, lecture, I'm gonna go ahead and start off with the election of 1796, and I'm going to take you through the Adams administration and all the challenges that 
uh, <laughs> they're gonna go through. And then we will finish it off with the election of 1800 uh, and the um, process that led to Thomas Jefferson's election, okay? So I'll see you for that one. Um, and uh, I'll catch you next time, okay? See you later, bye.